All right. Well, again, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Doug Cook. I'm the Education Events Coordinator for NOFA Mass. And with us today uh, is Carol Rosell, our co-host and Education Director at NOFA Mass. I'm really excited to have you all here for this second part of the Farmer to Farmer Intensive, where we will be focusing on nutrient management. And this is a great opportunity for us to learn from our peers. Um, so we have two short presentations, followed by um, a nice chunk of time for questions and answers. So today uh, we have Francis Thick and Heather Darby. I wanna say thank you again, and I'm gonna turn it over to Heather. Great, thanks Doug, and thanks everyone for um, participating today on this um, beautiful Sunday afternoon. Well, mostly beautiful. The sun's not shining, but um, always a beautiful day um, when you can go out and spend some time just taking in the fresh air and the snow. So I'm glad that people could pull themselves away for a few minutes to come and learn a little bit about nutrient management and soil management and um, appreciate being asked to present on this topic. It's something that I work on quite a bit with farmers here in Vermont. I work with the University of Vermont Extension and part of my role there is to um, teach farmers about nutrient management and how to approach nutrient management on their farm. And I'm really excited to have Francis joining me today. I've known Francis for quite a while and also um, appreciate the depth and knowledge that he brings also on, on this topic. So I was just gonna start with a little bit of an introduction of nutrient management um, and, and soil tests. And then Francis is gonna dive in a little more uh, deeply to some of the principles of regenerative ag and how they apply to soil management as well. So nutrient management, um, I guess kind of simply, even though it's very uh, complex, is taking the nutrients um, and fertility and organic matter sources that you have on your farm and combining those with pur purchased amendments that you might need to be able to meet the needs of your crops um, while building soil health and minimizing nutrient losses into the environment. So, you know, it, it sounds... All right. So as I was saying, nutrient management is pretty complex. It includes more than just thinking about nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, it's really about building organic matter levels, testing the nutrient sources you have on your farms to understand what's in them and how you can best utilize them. Um, thinking really about maximizing nutrient capture um, and minimizing losses by getting those amendments worked into the soil. Um, testing your soils regularly, and, we'll, and I'll touch on that briefly. There's lots of different testing that you can do on your soil. Um, really, this is to help you gauge where you're at, um, where you wanna head, and then help you to keep track of, of how you're doing. Um, you need to balance nutrients that are coming onto the farm versus those that are really leaving. So you don't want to really be out of balance. You want to try to balance things so that you're um, not increasing nutrients too much on your farm and you're not drawing down nutrients too much on your farm. Both can be detrimental to crops, um, to the environment, and to overall productivity. You really want to pay attention to the structure of your soil um, and use the crops on your fields or cover crops to be able to grow new nutrients and also to enhance that soil structure. Um, using crops to minimize nutrients lo nutrient losses and to build up organic matter on your farm so that you have that nutrient bank over time. And man, maintaining the soil pH, we often, um, I don't wanna say we forget about it. I feel like it's something that's very um, commonly talked about, but I, I do know in Vermont, um, oftentimes people overlook the soil pH 
um, because they don't realize what an impact it has on, on nutrients and biology and structure on their farm. So again, nutrient management is pretty complex, um, but there are easy ways to, to start to approach it. I, you know, on my own farm, we have um, cattle here and um, in my extension life, <laughs> I conducted an experiment one time because I was working with a farm that had really um, depleted soils. And they kept telling me that they couldn't afford um, to fertilize the fields. Um, and, you know, they asked me to come out and take soil tests, which I did. And I kept telling them that, you know, you, we really need to get some fertility on these fields. And they were buying feed for their cattle. So we set up a little experiment where we amended the soils, just purely looking at the nutrients that were needed on that soil test versus not doing that. And relative forage quality is basically just a way to look at the overall quality of the feed. And you can see when we added the fertility that those crops needed, um, they produce better feed. They produce more yield and more quality for that farm. Um, and then it also resulted in, in more um, milk production for that farm. And this was really important to them, not um, necessarily that they needed to make more milk, but they needed to make more milk by buying less grain and increasing their forage quality um, through amending the soils and taking this care of the soils allowed them to buy less grain, feed more of their own feed, um, and, and maintain that milk production at a lower cost. So nutrient management can really help the bottom line. It's important to take care of your soil and the needs of the soil. Um, and again, just, just economics alone are really a valuable reason to manage nutrients on your farm. We also talk a lot about the environment around us. Um, it's obviously critical to life on earth. You know, and, and this is the balance um, that, you know, agriculture really has to deal with is the fact that um, not only do we need food to survive, but we also need a healthy environment. And being that farmers are, you know, really some of the largest uh, land managers in our country, it's really important for farmers to have their eye not only on food production, but on the environment as well. So it is a heavy lift um, that we look at to the agricultural community. But nutrient management, again, can really meet all of those needs. You know, it can help produce healthy, high quality food while minimizing those losses to the environment. So, you know, just to quickly start, just wanna keep track of the time here. Uh, we, and I can't see, so I have to use my, oh, you can't see me anyway in my video, it's off. <laughs> I did put my glasses on to look at the clock. Um, you know, I'm, I am an extension person and, you know, our conversations always start with, well, you know, do you have a soil test? Um, and really soil testing, regular old soil testing, um, which is, you know, sort of um, not as, uh, <laughs> I guess, I don't want to say not, a, not as sexy as some of the new tests that are out there today where you can um, measure everything imaginable in your soil, but regular old soil testing is, is really a good baseline start to, to figure out where to start with nutrient management. Um, and it's cheap and it's easy to do. It's something you can do on your own. It doesn't require a lot of complex you know, handling and cooling the soils, et cetera. Um, and it's a really good way to just get started with nutrient management so that you can understand where you're starting at um, on your farm. And then there's also this sort of question of, well, you know, do I need to analyze these amendments on my farm? And personally, um, I feel that understanding what's in the manure or compost that you have on your farm is really important because you wouldn't just go and buy a bag of fertilizer, you know, down at the um, 
you know, farm store without knowing what was in it. And I really feel that same way about these amendments that you have on your farm. It's really important to understand what's actually in that manure or in that compost so that you're not over applying amendments because over application really isn't always the way to build up soil organic matter on your farm or nutrients. It can be really detrimental to the environment. So understanding what you're dealing with to start with is really important. So here's a extremely complex graph that I actually, or table I just put together for another project where we were trying to put, trying to really understand what labs across the country are offering um, analysis, nu nutrient and beyond analysis, because farmers are really interested in understanding more about their soil beyond um, the standard chemical tests. So the, the very basic nutrient analysis that I just talked about. And there are a number of labs um, that are starting to test for the biology in the soil and the physical properties of the soil. But it is quite expensive. Um, and you can see those tests range anywhere from um, $30 up to $130 to be able to see and, and really evaluate biology and physical properties. Um, and so I, I don't always recommend these. Sometimes I think it's really interesting to go out and take those tests, um, especially if you have a real problem out in the field. But what I want to, um, I think, send home with people is the fact that your own <laughs> power of observation can help you really understand the physical and biological properties of your soil by just being out there, seeing how the crops are growing, what they look like, digging into the earth and looking at the, the soil and smelling it in your hands can really tell you a lot about what's happening out there um, and not necessarily needing to spend hundreds of dollars for someone to tell you that the biology is really missing. Um, so I'm sure uh, Francis will talk about this quite a bit more, but I know on my own farm, I, I know what fields need help. Um, and more so really what I need to know are, you know, the practices and principles to put into place to make it better. All right, so, oh. I'm just gonna go over a regular soil test report really quickly, and then we'll move over to Francis. Because again, you know, generally this is what people have readily available to them. I do really recommend this because it is hard to sometimes look at a field and see if it's really low in a nutrient um, or what the organic matter content is like. So I do think they're important, especially that, you know, even the pH, and you don't want to see dying crops on your farm or really nutrient stressed crops on your farm because um, those are usually the signals that something has gone wrong. You don't, you don't want to get there. Um, so a standard soil test can be very helpful. And this is the one from um, UVM. And you know, just to highlight a few pieces, up here on the top, you have this nice little graph. And this graph shows you the macronutrients like phosphorus and potassium and magnesium. And then it shows you the, the levels of those. So you can see here the phosphorus level of this soil is considered medium. And the potassium level is also medium. And the magnesium level is considered higher excessive. And most labs show this kind of what we would call an interpretation table. So, so what does this mean? Um, so, so what it's telling you is if you are growing a crop and um, you add phosphorus to the soil based on the soil test, so this soil test says you need 40 pounds, which is down at the bottom, there's a medium chance that you would see a crop response. That's all that that means, which is really important, right? So if you're talking about magnesium, this is basically saying um, you don't need any magnesium. 
If you add magnesium, you're not going to see a crop response. It's pretty unlikely. And actually, um, you know, adding nutrients when they're in that range could lead to potential um, environmental issues. Okay. So what you really want to pay attention to are those nutrients that are especially in the low category, because that what that's really telling you is, you know, your plants are probably suffering. They're not getting the nutrients that they need. And if you apply nutrient, that particular nutrient or any of the nutrients that are in those categories, you will likely see a crop response because the levels are really low in the soil. So it really gives you a way to interpret those results because otherwise, if you had me say to you, well, um, your phosphorus level is 3.9 parts per million. You know, Doug would say, oh, okay, great. That, that's, that's wonderful, right? Um, but, but as a farmer, you need to know, well, is that good or, or is it not? And again, the soil test helps you understand that, that, you know, you probably could use some. And if you apply phosphorus, it will help you keep the nutrient levels um, up in the soil and give the crops what they need, okay? So that's just a, a really basic overview of what, what those levels mean when you see them in the soil test. Now let's look at pH. So you can see the pH of this soil is 6.6. .6. And then you can go over to the soil organic matter over to the right, okay? And in this soil, it's 3.3, .3, so it's, it's pretty low. And then you can see the effective cation exchange capacity, the CEC is 14.1. And the base saturation, um, it has a base saturation with calcium 91% of the bases, potassium 1.6% of the bases, and magnesium 6.5% of the bases. Now, most of you on the call, maybe you're all saying, oh, that, that's great. Yep, looks good. Um, but a lot of people get confused by these terms on the soil test. They look at them and they, they're, what's a CEC? What does that even mean? And you, we hear a lot from people about what the base saturation should be, but, but what does that really mean? You know, How does that impact the soils? And same with the pH. And these are pieces of your soil tests that are actually extremely useful. Um, and they do largely impact biology um, and also nutrient availability in your soil. So it's really important to understand what they actually do. Okay, so let's talk about the pH. Here's this graph that I'm sure many of you have seen before. Um, and most crops that we grow, with the exception of a few, um, like pHs that are slightly acidic, okay? So that means below seven. Um, when you have pHs that are way over seven or way below six, what do you see? Okay, you see these lines get thinner, right? And in some cases, you see them get larger. So that means more or less of that nutrient becomes available as the pH becomes more acidic, right? So in the case of some of these micronutrients, that's not good. That's actually bad because micronutrients can be very toxic to a plant if you get too much. And with our macronutrients, when your plants need a lot of them, if you don't have them available in that right pH range, your plants are gonna suffer, okay? So keeping the pH where it needs to be is critical, All right? And here's just some problems that show up if your soils are too acidic or too alkaline, right? All right, now one thing people do not realize is when your soil pH is too low, it impacts um, the biology of your soil. The biology of your soil also thrives when the pH is over six. And in particular, the biology that makes nitrogen available to your crops, okay? So, so it's really critical way beyond just the nutrients that are floating in your soil. It's really important to the biology. 
okay? All right, so let's talk about that cation exchange capacity. Here it's 14.1, so that's CEC. So what is the cation exchange capacity? So it's the ability for your soils to hold on to positively charged nutrients. Okay, so here's positively charged nutrients, calcium, potassium, magnesium, and your soil can hold on to those because soil, most soil has a negative charge, okay? So clay has a negative charge, that's in this picture. And this says humus, okay? Which is a type of organic matter also has a negative charge. So the negative charge in your soil holds on to positively charged nutrients. So what does that mean if you um, hold on to nutrients? It means they don't get lost into the, in, into the environment potentially, right? It also means they're not necessarily quickly taken up by your plants, but if you think about it, a sandy soil, which is not a clay and usually has low organic matter, does not have negative charge. What do we know about sandy soils as a farmer? They drain well, right? And they're constantly having to be fed because they're leaky. And they're leaky because they don't have any negative charge. So if you have a soil that's sandy, how do you build charge to be able to hold on to those nutrients? You build organic matter, okay? So most, um, in, in some soils, like a sandy soil, 50% to almost 100% of the soil's ability to hold on to nutrients comes from organic matter. All right, um, so let's talk about base saturation. So here's my soil with negative charge. And you can see all the positively charged nutrients holding on to it, right? So the bases, things that make the soil basic, right? Are calcium, magnesium, potassium. There's some others as well, like sodium, and ammonium, they're bases. They make the soil basic. Base saturation says what percentage of those negative charges has bases, okay? And if you think about it, if you want the soil to be high in pH, you need it to have bases, not acids, all right? So, Here's a soil and it has one, two, three calciums, two magnesiums, um, three potassiums. So what percentage of the soil is covered with bases, okay? Is it half, um, is it 80%, right? So that's what that's showing you. So our base saturation on that soil test said that 91% of the soil negative charges had calcium on them. That's what that is saying, okay? Now, what if that said only, um, what if it said the calcium base saturation was 50%? Yikes, okay? So if there's not bases, then that means there's acids there. And if you looked at the pH of the soil, I said it was 6.6 which means that it was mostly basic, right? And it shows up in the base saturation, which said there were 90% calciums, okay? So I put aluminum on here, glasses back on. Okay, I'm gonna be done in two minutes. Um, I put aluminum on here because most of you are from New England, I'm assuming, except for Francis and maybe a few other people. But aluminum is an acid that is highly prevalent in soils of the Northeast. And it, you know, comes from old forest soils. You know, it's part of the parent material of our soil. So we have many soils throughout New England and the Northeast that are really high in aluminum, which also means they're generally driven to have very low pHs because there's a lot of acid, okay? 
So we have this is something we have to deal with locally. And if you have a low pH, you need to understand is that pH low because of high aluminum or is that pH low because of hydrogens, right? We know hydrogen is also an acid. And the reason you want to know that is because Okay. Heather, could you repeat that? We you cut out for a moment. Okay. Um what I'm saying is if you have a lot of aluminum, it's really hard to get off of your soil because it has this valence of three plus, which in, you know, just really basically it means it's stuck on there really hard, much harder than the hydrogen that only has that one valence. So if you have a lot of aluminum in your soil, it's going to take a lot of lime, right, which is calcium carbonate to get this aluminum off of there because it's it's strong, it's really strong. So if you have high aluminum soils, it might take four, maybe six tons of lime to raise the pH versus if you're just dealing with hydrogen, it may only take one ton. So this is really important um, component for us here in the Northeast, okay? So this is just the effect of liming as I was saying before, you add that lime to the soil and you displace the acids, okay? So the stronger the acid or the more acid, the more lime you have to apply to displace those hydrogens and get them off the soil. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna end on that um, because I know Francis also has a lot to say and I just wanted to give you some basic information about soil tests and nutrient management, and I hope that that was helpful and will add to what um, Francis is going to talk about. Great. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Heather. <clears throat> All right, that was a great overview of nutrient management. <clears throat> um, I saw a question pop up about testing soils yourself to make it easier and cheaper. Um, I saw though on the uh, soil test sheet that Heather had that was only $15 a sample for the basic soil test. And um, if you've ever tested soils, I don't think you can do it for that price. Just to just address that question to start with. But what I'd like to do is, is um, look at soils from the organic matter perspective. And Doug, can you put up the slides? Yes. There we go. And um, I want to look at it from the perspective of soil health. And, and regenerative agriculture. Um, basically, the way I look at soils is that organic matter is that if you don't have organic matter, you don't have soil. And it's interesting to think about that. Here in, in Iowa, we have some of the most productive soils in the world, so they say. Um, but in Northern Iowa, 12,000 years ago, when the last glacier left, there was no soil at all. <clears throat> so in those 12,000 years, um, nature's ecology developed some of these high productive soils by putting organic matter in it, making it rich and black with organic matter. And um, that was an ecological process. So as plants and animals colonized that loose geologic material that the glacier scraped off of Canada and um, Minnesota and dropped here in Iowa, um, that's what made soil. It went from no organic matter to very high organic matter. And so organic matter is really the, the core of soil in my mind. And you've probably seen this slide before of, um, what are the principles of soil health or regenerative agriculture? And that is that keeping our soil covered at all times, minimizing the physical and chemical disturbance of soil, tillage and, and, and um, chemicals put on the soil, having living roots in the soil at all times, having a lot of diversity in the plants and integrating animals where possible. Those um, are things that really contribute to a growing organic matter. Next slide, please. And if we look at um, what nature did here in the Midwest with the prairies, all of these principles apply. Soil is always covered, no chemicals applied. In, you know, nature's ecology didn't need any herbicides or pesticides to grow <laughs> that organic matter to grow all these plants. Um, living roots all the time, great diversity, and of course animals. And part of that process was that the bison would come through and graze off that prairie plant, those prairie plants, and um, then when the plant was was short or knocked down, it didn't need all that root mass. It had a very deep root system. So it sloughed some of that root mass off into the soil 
and grow new tops and new roots. And so those episodes of animals coming in and grazing um, pulsed that organic matter deep in the soil and, and made those rich soils. Next slide. Now here in Iowa and throughout the Midwest, most of the soils are bare, violating all the principles during the winter. Next slide. And even a lot of them are, are tilled. And so, um, you know, in Iowa, which I think is sometimes can be used as a worst case um, example of, of regenerative agriculture, um, two thirds of our whole land surface is in corn and soybeans every year. And um, so those crops only grow for about five or maybe even four months out of the year. So during most of the year, the soil does not have living roots. And really, for soybeans, no cover, and we're still like this, um, no cover also. Next slide. And so the living roots are important. So next slide. And, and um, cover crops, of course, are important for that, if you can get a cover crop in there. And so that during a time when the corn or soybeans are not growing, then you have live roots in the soil, and you also have photosynthesis going on. So you have some action. And you also have the feeding of the soil bacteria. Because um, we know that, of course, photosynthesis allows the plant to, to, to use light to make to fix carbon, um, to make sugars, reduce sugars that can be used to grow the plant's body tissues. But also what's being discovered more and more is that the plant will, will spit out or exude a lot of that liquid carbon that it created through photosynthesis into the soil. So the plant can, can exude like 30% some more of the carbon that it fixes into the soil. And you think that's a waste, but what it's doing is feeding the soil bacteria. And then the soil bacteria will um, help solubilize and cycle nutrients for the plant. And so there's that symbiotic relationship. So you can see if the soil is bare for most of the year, nothing growing, then all these bacteria are dormant. You really starve them. And if we only have two crops that we ever grow, corn and soybeans, then we have a, a much narrower range of bacteria that will really, um, and, and fungi that will colonize that. Next slide. Now what um, many organic farmers are starting to do in the Northeast as well as well in the Midwest is, um, is to allow that crop we saw before, cereal rye in that cornfield, allow that to grow all the way up about six feet tall to anthesis where it starts to flower. And this is on my farm. Um, what, what I did, I do then is I come in and I drill soybeans directly into that crop of um, rye. And next slide. And then you can see that the, the, the uh, drill just about flattened it all out. But we also come through with a roller to roller cripper to make sure that the plants are, are, are killed. Because when the rye is in that flowering stage, then it, it doesn't easily go back into the vegetative stage to grow more plant leaves and so on. Once it gets to that re reproductive stage. And so um, it tends to stay down, especially if you have a high biomass and um, if you get it at the, right, at the right time at anthesis or even a little later. Next slide. So now you have all this biomass and the research shows you need about 8,000 pounds per acre of biomass, rye biomass in order to keep the weeds down adequately. And here you can see, um, in this case, I planted with on 15 inch rows, um, the soybeans. And you can see that the soybeans are coming through the, the mat, but because um, the weeds, the weeds don't seem to make it through. Most weed seeds are small and don't have enough energy to get through that mass, but the soybeans have a more energetic seed and can get through there. You can see a few little sprigs of rye coming out of the base of the rye plants, but they never really amount to anything to speak of if it's got at the right stage. Next slide. And so the, the soybeans can grow up through there. Of course, you don't need any herbicides. And now we have this, um, this great habitat for the soil that mulches the soil, uh, holds in the moisture that you have. And if it rains, it'll keep that moisture easy, more easily. And the soil cannot, um, it won't get baked out by the sun. Next slide. And so this is also on my farm, the same field um, as it comes up. Uh, you know, now, now I will say that I've done this a, a number of years and it's really critical to get the right amount of biomass. If you don't have enough biomass of the rye, um, you're going to get weeds. And I've had some weedy fields. <laughs> next slide. But what I'm, so I think the next slide is, yeah, what I'm actually doing this year is I invested in, in a weed zapper. 
<laughs> I don't know if um, any of you have seen these. Uh, basically, on the on the back of that tractor, you can't hardly see it. Is a a, um, a generator. It volt it generates high voltage, and the front is a bar that electrocutes the weeds that stick up above the soybean canopy. And I've um, seen this done, and I've seen some amazing results. And so what I'm thinking with this is that I can really um, get back into those principles of regenerative agriculture. Because with organic, often we have to, to use a lot of tillage to, to grow soybeans. Otherwise, we may need a half a dozen tillage uh, um, trips through there, which we all know is not the best, but we, we do it because we have to do it. Well, what I'm thinking with this situation is if I come in in the fall and put in a rye crop, and I first I'll make a, the first year, make a seed bed, a good seed bed. And so um, it'll be smooth too. And, and then in the spring, roll down that rye crop, put in soybeans, and now I can kill the weeds without having to till. And also I don't create any ridges, which I would create if I cultivated. Now I can come back in the fall and I can um, come in after the soybeans come out and plant in wheat, no till wheat in. And then next spring, if I get wheat uh, weeds in the wheat, which sometimes happens, I can come back again and keep them keep them out with this this machine. Um, and so basically, I'm looking. I'm pretty excited about this. I could get into a completely no-till kind of a system, because after after that wheat comes out, I could plant any number of crops. Um, corn is the exception that you can't really um, do very well with this kind of system because um, corn gets too tall too fast. So I'm pretty excited about this as a way to get, really take my farm to the next level of, um, of reducing or maybe even eliminating tillage to a certain degree. Next slide. Okay, and the next one is um, plant diversity. And I'm learning myself here um, how to try to make my crops more diverse um, because more diversity of plants means more soil microbiological diversity too. Next slide. Um, this slide shows, these are prairie plants, but you can see when you have a diversity of plants, you have all kinds of different root systems going on. Some are deeper, some are shallow and different microorganisms will colonize the roots of different plants in different ways, different uh, species. And so you get much more diversity and there's been some interesting experiences or and even research showing that if you have more diversity, um, there's even more drought tolerance among the plants compared to a monoculture. And so um, in my experience, for example, I generally plant oats um, when I use, I, I plant a new hay field. I put like with, with alfalfa and grasses and clovers, I'll plant oats as a nurse crop. Well, last year I planted oats and peas and um, and it's pretty interesting to see. I think that I, I think I have a lot more going on in the soil. I haven't really measured, but also for the the, uh, the forage, I always take it off as forage. The oats, in this case, the oats and peas, and I rolled it up as baleage. And um, when I, I switched just a couple weeks ago from um, baleage of pure oats to baleage of oats and peas, the cows just went for it a whole lot more. And so it was pretty amazing that not only I think it's better for the soil, but it's um, better for the animals as well. Next slide. Diversity is always good, probably for the cow's guts as well as for the um, as well as for the soil. And here's what I mentioned earlier: is that when plants um, photosynthesize, they take that energy to make sugars, liquid sugars, that they then turn into into one plant tissues. They're they're uh, they're lignins and, and um, cellulose and, and proteins, but they all also send a lot of it down into the soil. And so the soil microorganisms colonize that rhizosphere and they, they symbiotically help the plants um, take up those uh, nutrients. Next slide. And, and the last principle I have here is to integrate animals. And in my case, I have a dairy farm, so it makes it easy to do. And so not everyone can do that, but next slide. But if you can, I think you can take it to an, another level. And in, in my case, I um, the cows um, get new, new pasture twice a day. Next slide. And so I split up a large section of our farm into paddocks. And so you can see here, um, we have about 60 paddocks plus um, 
beyond this map, we have fields of hay and so on that we can graze as well. But you can see um, each paddock is in the range of about two acres and they have the lanes that go through. So the cows can come from the milking area at the bottom with the, you see the red barns. And um, after each milking, all I have to do is open the next gate for the next paddock and the cows go in and I close the gate and they harvest their own feed. They spread their own manure right where it needs to be and they enjoy their work. And of course they're healthier <clears throat> because they're in their natural environment. And so um, managing, as you probably know, managing pastures is an art in itself. And often when early in the year, I will um, graze just half a paddock. I'll put a dividing wire in when the grass is growing fast and getting tall in order to um, um, make it a little denser of, of animals per acre. And so, um, as I say, I give them the milk cows twice a day, they get fresh grass. Next slide. And um, I use different techniques at different times. Here is a kind of a mob grazing. And this is a photo from somebody else's farm, but I thought it was kind of a nice one. And you can see on the right where the cows are going next. You can see the grass is getting tall. And at a certain time of the year, I use this mob grazing. When, um, when the grass is starting to head out, it grows very fast, gets tall, and it's hard to keep up with your grazing. So then I will try to um, do a more of intensive grazing and, and get the cows back together. And you can imagine this is kind of like when the bison came through and grazed the prairie, is that what they didn't eat, they matted down which is great because now we, you can see where they were, their manure is there, which is uh, the fertility coming, uh, staying there. And um, the grass that's matted down there is gonna be like a mulch layer as well. And, and I, I'm assuming um, that the plant that's down can still translocate some of that energy back down into the roots and, and have energy for growing the next, uh, for regrowth. Um, now early, uh, that's what I do at that stage. Um, Later in the year, once I get past the hen out stage of grass, I'll do more what's called take half and leave half, because then the grasses won't head out again. Once a year is all they'll head out, um, or most grasses, cool season grasses. And so um, then I will just take half of it and, and don't like mat it down like this. And then the plant has a lot of residual leaves left to serve as solar collectors to be able to recover very quickly. Because if you graze it down to the ground, then the grass has very little surface area and little energy left in the roots. And there'll be a lag phase where the, the grass will be slow to take off and slow to grow before it starts to get enough leaf area to grow fast. Next slide. And so this is what I don't do. And this is what you see mostly around the Midwest um, with cows on pasture is that they're in the same pasture all the time. And so they'll nibble everything down and all that here, except for the, the thistles. Um, basically all that can survive is like a bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass that can survive that, that hard aggressive grazing. Next slide, because the taller grasses will tend to die. And this kind of illustrates what happens if you can, for example, on the right, this is the set stocking from the last um, photo, but the grass is very short and when the grass is very short all the time, the roots become shallow and they, they don't never get a chance, they never get a chance to take off and, and grow deep. Whereas if you look over further on the left, 50%, if you take half and leave half, then the plant is able to maintain a strong root system and recover more quickly. Next slide. Um, this is um, some data from um, Dr. Alan Williams from um, Mississippi. And I believe this is 10 years. And on top is his adaptive grazing system. He calls it high, adaptive high stocking density, um, the first row. And then at the bottom is a continuous grazing, like the slide I showed you with the short grass. And if you look over at carbon tons per acre, you can see that it went from 22 for the continuous grazing to 51 in about 10 years. So he more than doubled his carbon content of his soil from um, just this intensive kind of grazing. Next slide. And if we look at organic matter in the soil, um, there are many pool or several pools, you could say. And if you look at up on top, the living organisms are, are usually less than 5%. But there is also the fresh residue, which is what you're adding to the soil, crop residue and so on. And of course, the plants also putting, um, well, that's not residue, but um, putting uh, sugars into the soil. And then the, uh, uh, to the down below, the more purple is the decomposing organic matter. This is the organic matter that's cycling through 
and slowly decomposing. And of course, a lot of that carbon is um, goes off as carbon dioxide as the as the organisms burn it up for their energy for their own activities. Um, but a certain fraction of it goes into this humus that Heather mentioned. Um, nowadays, they don't even use the term humus, but um, um, par uh, particulate matter or associated or something. <laughs> um, but um, so you can see that that humus pool is pretty large. And that humus pool, as Heather pointed out, it functions as a reservoir for um, cations. And it, so it, it, it does a lot of things, actually. It, it, and beyond that, too, um, it... it um, helps to aggregate the soils and so on. Um, but the point I wanna make here with this pie graph is that if you starve the soil, that little, that green slice, the fresh residue, if you don't give it anything for most of the year, if not, if not much goes in there, then you don't have much for the purple to, to decompose it. But the, or, the organism will still try to be active and they'll start to burn up more of the humus. A certain amount of the humus gets decomposed every year anyway by the microorganisms. But if you have less, fresh residue coming in, fresh, if you're not feeding your soil, your soil bacteria, you'll be depleting your humus. So in a sense, um, if you look at the bigger picture, nature's ecology, whether it's a prairie or a forest, created that pool of organic matter, all that, that humus, that rich humus. And that's, you might say, your ecological capital. And if you're not feeding that, maintaining it, you're really deficit spending that ecological capital. And so over the years, you'll, you'll lose that pool of, of organic matter. So it's important that we do continue to feed that organic matter. And you're not gonna see humus organic matter levels rise quickly, probably. But that doesn't mean it's not working. If you're filling up those, these pools of fresh residue and decomposing organic matter, then you're, you're, you have the bacteria being active. They're not dormant. And you're, you're going in the right direction. Next slide. So um, there's a, a, maybe you know him, Gary Zimmer is a kind of a famous soil consultant in the Midwest. And he said something once that I thought was pretty cool. He said, soil biology trumps soil chemistry. And that means that, um, well, first of all, we, we need to take care of our soils as, as Heather pointed out, soil tests and, and see where we're at, especially pH, I think. I agree with what she said, that you gotta get your pH in the right range so that the microbes can work well and what nutrients you have are working well. But when you got soil biology going on, um, sometimes things can happen that kind of go outside of the, the paradigm of soil fertility. And I'm reminded of uh, when I first came to the farm that I'm on now, um, I was doing this paddock grazing and the soil specialist uh, from the Iowa State University uh, had a field day and he came down and tested the soils that we we're gonna be looking at and um, the a week before. And uh, because I had just gotten started, I had, wasn't really getting around to testing. And um, on the day of the field day, I took them to a, a really good paddock full of clover and just and grasses, really great. And he was saying, now with all this clover, this, this soil is gonna be at least a pH 6.2. And, um, and then he pulled out the soil sample, which he just got, and it said 5.3, <laughs> which was funny um, because you know, I had, I've been thinking about that for many years. Um, and and the, the, the point I think is that the soil biology was very strong on that field because the previous owner had wintered cows there years in a row. And so we had all that, that carbon residual from the hay and so on. And so the organic matter was really popping in that, field, in that little paddock. And so um, things were happening that probably shouldn't have been happening according to the regular paradigm of, um, of soil fertility, which is what I, I of course studied for years. Uh, next slide. And I don't want to end in a here. I guess I'm going to end in a kind of a heresy here. This is um, how soil tests are calibrated. There's a lot of field data. All these black points are data from the field. And then what they're doing is they're looking at what is the um, what is the soil test value in, in the in the laboratory. The laboratory tries to extract as much as possible the, the fraction of a nutrient, let's say phosphorus, that the plant could could take out of the soil. And so that extractable phosphorus is correlates usually to what the plant can take out of the soil. And so you, you'll test it. Now, if you look at this, this test here, um, you can see that it's really a scatter diagram. And, but as a rule, where the soil tests are higher, the yield is pretty high relatively to the 100%. But look in the, um, the, on the left is very low, then low, then optimum, then high, then very high. But look in the low slot. 
And you'll see that when phosphorus is low, we have um, yields from way down below 50% to above 100%. And I, it makes me wonder why is that? And and I wonder. And a lot of so variabilities variables probably fit in there. But I I would think it'd be really interesting to study what the um, soil biological activity is of all those um, different te uh, test levels. And I would I would guess that the higher ones are where your soil is more active. Um, but coming back to soil testing again, um, that. You know, I was I was pleased to see that the Vermont soil test is fifteen dollars, and that's kind of land grant university tests are in that range for the basic test. I'm not a big advocate, even though I'm a soil scientist, for for doing a lot of fancy soil testing. They're very expensive, and sure, you can do it to see how it's going. But if you're, I, I more advocate for optimizing everything you have on your farm. In my case, I have a dairy farm, and I have. Um, the manure that's available, I'll use it, of course, on corn, but also in the midsummer, when the pastures start to slump from the heat um, and so on, that's a time to put a layer of, a, a little layer of a boost of, of, of manure on those paddocks, because then I can get a good, uh, I think I get a good return on that manure investment and, and better um, results for the rest of the year. So trying to use what you have, your, your resources judiciously, and, and using cover crops and having something living in the soil. So if you're going in the right direction, uh, as much as you can, fulfilling those five principles of regenerative agriculture, you're doing the best you can. And so um, I, I don't see a lot of value in, in trying to spend a lot of money in, in um, testing all those biological parameters. I mean, you, you can once in a while, but, um, or if you have a problem, like Heather said, I think that's my last slide. Thank you so much, Francis, and thank you, Heather. And thank you for everyone in the chat putting your questions in there. We'll basically start out, um, I think we can start from the top and we'll, we'll, we'll come back down through what we've got. All right, so just to um, gets get started. During Heather's presentation, Richard asked, are there any do-it-yourself soil tests that you would recommend? Or even like, you know, on at the farm, maybe not soil tests, but soil health indicators that you would recommend? Well, I mean, there are pH, really simple pH kits. You can, you can, buy and use and meters and things that don't cost a lot of money, especially if if you're needing to know the pH of the soil. Um, and there are some do it yourself soil test kits. I don't I don't really think they're that inexpensive, though, like the Lamont soil test kits. I don't know, Francis, if you've ever worked with any of those. But um, I mean, really, besides pH, just good observation. Um, observational tools and, um, you know, our, our soil tests here are pretty cheap. So I, I don't know if you could get the you know, information that that quickly and cheap as sending it in. But Francis. Yeah, I think you're right, Heather. Um, I mean, for like $15, you're getting cation exchange capacity. Um, you're getting P and K and pH and organic matter. Um, if you try to do all those yourself, you're going to spend a lot of time. I've, I've used those Lamont test kits in um, classes I taught. And, you know, it's good if you want to have fun, but I wouldn't recommend doing it regularly. Yeah. And I think soil health, you know, really it's getting down on the ground, you know. And um, I know on my own farm, when I'm out there, I, I, you know, you see the difference visually very clearly between soils that have what I would consider biological constraints or physical constraints, you know, the, just looking at the surface of the soil tells you a ton, um, you know, whether it's rock hard or, you know, cracked and, and um, without any life, I mean, you should be seeing all kinds, you should see residue on the surface, you should see biological activity. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I just, 
I don't see a lot of use even for, for some of the fancier respiration tests or any of those things you can buy at home. I think Francis, you, you said something similar. Yeah, next question. What was the next question? Oh, well, we have a question from Yoko of Asawaga Farm. And I wonder if, Yoko, would you like to ask your question about um, humus holding both anions, anions and cations? Hello. So I'm trying to share my video. Oh, really dark. Um, yeah, so my question was, when I saw that slide with the, you know, illustration of the humus and, you know, it's negatively charged and it was only um, attracting positive ions. I was just wondering, because I've heard of, you know, other anions being able to associate with these clay particles and humus, I'm just wondering what, how that is and how that fits into the, the illustration that you showed in that slide. Well, if I could jump in, um, there is some anion exchange capacity on, on humus, but in, in temperate regions like we have here, the cation exchange capacitor is a lot stronger. It's, it's more predominant. Now in tropical soils, um, they tend to have very little cation exchange capacity, if any, um, because most of the bases are weathered out of the soil. And so they tend to have actually an anion exchange capacity in tropical soils that are very weathered. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Heather. No, I mean, I put some things in the chat as well, but yeah, I mean, the cation exchange capacity is the predominant capacity here. There is some anion exchange and, and primarily here it holds on to phosphorus like H2, PO4 minus and, um, but it's not, it's not uh, just as large as the CEC. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And while we're on that topic, Stacy asked um, about calcium and magnesium com competing with each other. Um, Stacy, would you like to elaborate that? The question I think is worth having in the in the video here. Um, I'm not sure what was the question. They're competing with each other. I well, I think they were talking about like, um, so in the soil test example I showed Francis, it had excessive magnesium, but when you looked at the base saturation, the magnesium levels were sort of below that, you know, that sort of recommended 10 to 12%. It was like at 6% or something of the saturation. Um, so there, I think there was a little bit of like, well, if it's so high and excessive, why is it so low in the base saturation? And, you know, part, part of my explanation for that is the, the soil sort of uh, parent material background, really. That particular soil is from um, the Lake Champlain region, which is old ocean bottom. And so it's also extremely high in calcium. And we don't show calcium on that interpretation sheet. But, um, and calcium is stronger than magnesium on the uh, cation exchange capacity, like the base in the, um, and its ability to outcompete the other bases. Yeah, also, I think that um, if I got it right from your soil test, that uh, the magnesium measurement was in a total amount, whereas the um, base saturation is a percentage. That's so when, true. Yeah. You know, when calcium is very high, then everything else, even though there may be a lot of magnesium and a lot of potassium, it's going to be very low percentage-wise on the total. And, and I'm going to stick my neck out again here. In the Midwest, a lot of people spend a lot of money trying to um, reach certain very specific, narrow um, base saturation goals. And I'm skeptical of that for several reasons. One is that I've seen a lot of research, even in organic settings, where they cannot prove that these very specific base saturation ratios are, are helpful, like calcium being in a certain amount and magnesium a certain amount. I mean, a wide range maybe, but um, so I, I think that people can waste a lot of money trying to change their ratio of base saturation um, when it probably won't do them a lot of good. 
Yeah, I, I agree, Francis. Um, how how I always frame that in our you know nutrient management class is that university rec our our university recommendations actually use all of that information, um, and so you know it's like if you're looking at the pH and you're looking at relative nutrient you know values in the soil and the cation exchange and all the different pieces. Um, you know, the, the base saturation is sort of another piece of information, right? So we could see the calcium was, um, the percentage of it was, was really high in the soil. The bases were high overall, and, and that's supported by the pH also being high. Um, so anyway, I mean, they're, they're sort of tied together, but to put a, a ton of money and effort into, you know, changing those um, doesn't generally make sense, especially when we're looking at the, I always call it kind of the genetic background of the soil, which which is impossible to change, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's like a fight against nature in some ways. Right. And, and this is a good segue into Noah's question right here. Um, if, and talking about excessive nutrients, you know, what are some farming practices that you would recommend to reduce pollution into waterways while maintaining yields? Well, here in Iowa, um, the research shows that uh, um, cover crops average, on average reduce nitrate leaching by about 30%. And if you, if you let the cover crop grow taller, it, it'll be like up to 50 or 55% reduction in nitrate leaching, which is very interesting because Iowa, you know, as I mentioned, it's mostly corn and soybeans and both of those leak um, nitrogen bad. And it's interesting too, because soybeans, you don't put in, you don't add any nitrogen, but they leak nitrogen, nitrate, just about as bad, sometimes worse than corn. And so um, a recent study though, that was done in Iowa, um, looked at rotations of corn soybeans versus a, a more typical organic rotation of corn soybeans and then oats, uh, hay for a couple of years. And they found that the reduction in nitrate leaching was like 50%. Uh, compared to corn and soybeans, which is really amazing considering that the goal, Iowa's nutrient reduction strategy goal is to reduce nitrate leaching by 41% statewide. And um, we've made no progress at all on, on it. But just switching to a, a regular organic rotation exceeded that goal, which is very exciting. Yeah, and in regards to phosphorus, um... So nitrogen, like uh, Francis said, certainly, definitely cover crops um, help take up, you know, sort of that excess nitrogen that's left in the soil after the main crop. But with phosphorus, um, if you have excessive phosphorus in your soils, um, it's really hard to bring those levels down. And, you know, as an example, some of the farms that I've worked with, old, you know, dairy farms, they'll take on a new piece of land that um, they'll say something like, oh, you know, we've been managing that land for five years. We've never put manure on it. Why is the phosphorus level um, excessive? And, you know, phosphorus does not move um, like nitrogen does. And, you know, so really, watching the soil test levels, especially if you're adding a lot of phosphorus to the fields through, you know, composts and, and manures um, is one way just to monitor whether or not you're, you're getting to really excessive levels. Because once you do, you know, it's really hard to move it back the other way. It takes a really long time um, and long meaning more than five years. <laughs> um, and and once you have too much phosphorus in your soil, which, you know, historically we didn't really think could happen in a place like the Northeast because of all that aluminum, you can start to lose phosphorus in, you know, through leaching, which we never really realized could happen before. Um, so just watching the soil test levels is really important here. And then also to keep phosphorus from actually leaving the fields in the form of runoff and erosion, you know, is really thinking about how do you keep the soil on your field <laughs> versus losing it off from the fields. 
And that again has a lot to do with cover cropping um, and making sure that the soil is not eroding. And sometimes erosion isn't that visual. You know, a lot of people picture erosion as something you can always see visually through gullies or, um, you know, uh, like piled up soil at the end of your field, but it can be just really, um, yeah, it, it can be not law, uh, that visually seen. So reducing Putting practices into place that reduce soil loss is critical to managing phosphorus. Thanks, Heather. Richard, would you like to ask your question? Sure, thanks. Um, I have uh, a question about asparagus um, and why it, whether there's a nutrient reason for its requirement for a uh, high pH. I have heard that blueberries have a need for low pH because really they have a, a need for iron that they can't, their own particular transporter is not very good at transporting at higher pHs. And one can overcome that low pH requirement by using excess iron. Is that, A, is that true? And B, is there a similar situation for asparagus and, and what does it need? Thanks. I, yeah, I hope you can answer that one because I can't. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know a lot about asparagus, but I do know that it does not like acidic soils at all. Um, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure why, why that is, so, so I apologize for that. Um, it, it is a, a heavy user of phosphorus. I do know that. So keeping the, you know, the soil test not too high in pH, but also not too low. Um, I believe for asparagus, it's like the recommended range is six and a half to seven is, um, you know, is uh, the best range for most all, you know, the, all the nutrients, especially phosphorus to become available. So, but outside of that, I don't know, I'm sorry. Thanks. Uh, there's a message or a question from Kara. Would you like to ask that, Kara? Sure. I also just had a quick follow up on what you just said. Um, it occurred to me that earlier we were talking about the at home soil test kits, but what about um, specifically at home soil pH kits? Are those any better than the nutrient ones or are any of the meters on the market reliable? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we, we use a bunch of them um, for different things we're doing. So there are, there are some good ones out there um, that, that you can, you can purchase. They may not always give you sort of that exact range or that exact number. They oftentimes give you these ranges, but there definitely are some good ones. Um, any specific ones off the top of your head that you'd recommend? Cause I know there's no, a lot. Um, I'd have to go back to the few that we've used. So no, I'm sorry, but I no, could no, definitely follow up. But yeah, you're talk about, probably talking about litmus papers, right, Heather? Yeah, I mean, P Cornell used to offer a P8. P8. They still do, actually. We use them all the time, those um, pH kits. They were very, very popular. I don't, they're probably not as popular anymore, but they do give you more of a range of pH. And, and they're good. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of uh, vegetable growers and diversified folks here, I you know have blueberries and asparagus and all these different things, so it can be nice to kind of target. Yeah. Um, yep. So my other question just was, um, could the two of you just say a little bit more about the sort of changing definition of um, humus and what the most current soil science says about humic acids and human in the soil? Well, I I guess I'd, I would make a couple comments. One is that. Um, I, I took a whole semester of class in graduate school on humus chemistry. And I've learned recently that most of that was wrong <laughs> because it was a class on how to extract humic acids and, and uh, fulvic acids out of organic matter. And now the science, and I'm not really up on it, maybe Heather is, but um, people are saying that basically these humic acids and fulvic acids are an artifact of the extraction process and the chemicals used. Um, so now, I don't know, if maybe Heather probably knows more than I do, but basically uh, the, the resistant, resilient recalcitrant organic matter in the soil now that previously have been called humus is 
mineral associated organic matter, it's intertwined with the mineral and protected somewhat. And I, I think it's not really well known exactly what it is. Heather, any comments? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you, Francis. There's, there's a lot that gets floated around in presentations and um, conversations out in the farming community because there's product for sale where people are often selling some of these, um, I guess, humic acids to apply um, apply to soil and things like that. But I, you know, all of it is so complex in nature. Um, some, some of the, I guess, quote unquote, humic acids can be produced by the biology in the rhizosphere. Um, but still there's, it's a body of science that's largely under investigation. So um, yeah, I don't have a ton, ton to add there either. But it's not a product I would buy on my own farm to apply. <laughs> yeah, if you're in, you can create it, of course, with your soils. And if you have cover crops and a lot of living crops all the time, you, you shouldn't need it. And so, but if you're if you have soils that are bare for eight months out of the year, and then you add humic acids, you got to wonder about that. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. I guess I'll just have to keep looking to the journals to see what the next research is that will become coming out. <laughs> Great, thank you. And Lynn asked a question about smaller scale crop termination. Lynn, would you like to come off of mute and ask some more about that question? I'm sorry, Doug, can you, was that from the last one? I see earlier here in our chat, you asked about um, smaller scale and crimping. Oh, oh, yeah, I just, using a smaller scale, is there a hand way of crimping as opposed to having the tractor crimper? Well, you know, the first year I did it, I just used a, a culti mulcher, which is what you often use, of course, um, to make a good seed bed. And it worked really well. And I think it worked well because I was a little leery and I waited until past the anthesis. I waited till the early milk stage to roll it. And so by then the, the rye crop wasn't able to come back and it did a really good job. But so anything I can knock it down. Um, interestingly, I heard of one guy say that he, he rolled himself down the roll. <laughs> he just <laughs> rolled down in his garden and rolled the cover crop down. <laughs> so anything that can knock it down, even driving it down where the tires go, it's probably not going to come back up. Yes, yeah, so you have to break it basically, right? Well, you kink it, yeah. And the crimp, roller crimper, of course, kinks it in a number of spots all the way up the plant. But like, uh, with, like I said, with my, um, with my crimper, I'm sorry, my, my uh, culti mulcher. Oh. Yeah, I just flattened it. And so it kind of kinked it at the bottom. And, and so um, it can't, you know, that stock, when it gets so mature and goes into the reproductive stage, it really can't hardly come back up again as easily. Okay, thank you. Doug, I wonder, I know um, Yoko has uh, done a fair amount of, you've been crimping your um, rye this year, right? Do you want to speak to maybe, can I put you on the spot? Do you want to speak to how you do it? <laughs> Um, so we, we actually didn't, we cr uh, crimped part of our overwintered rye, but we mostly mowed the rest because uh, it was just such a hassle to put the tarps on. And sometimes I, I feel like you, if you get it just at the right timing of, you know, crimping at the right timing, you don't need the tarp. Um, but there are, I think, some stragglers that might come up after. So, um, you know, following Frith Farm and, you know, Daniel Mays there, uh, he usually tarps his, you know, rye after crimping. So we did that, but with two people, you know, it's a lot of work to put on tarps. So that's why we kind of moved towards uh, mowing the rye. But the downside of that is I don't think it sticks around for as long as if you had just pushed down the rye. Um, so... I don't know, we might explore doing the crimping again in the future, but at the moment we do find it's a little bit easier to, to mow than to crimp, um, yeah. 
Well, I think the Rodell, they did a lot of their research with, with mowing also, and they found it can be successful if you have enough biomass. And uh, you don't, of course, you don't want to chop it up, but if you can mow it down in a way that it, it lays flat and covers the whole area, some mowers will, of course, leave spots, bare spots, and that won't be good. But if you can, if you can mow it in a way that lays it down and covers the whole area, it can work too. And I'll just add that Sharon Gensler, um, who's a longtime educator with Nova Mass, um, yeah, Lynn, to your point, uses a hand scythe, so you anticipate it, which is just a sickle uh, or a crescent knife, a sickle knife, um, and just cuts it really close to the soil. Um, so kind of like almost like a flail mowing action or, or, a, or a scything action, but using a hand tool. And Richard, would you like to ask a bit about seeding rates for winter rye? Yeah, I was just wondering for broadcasting, uh, what are you what are you using for seeding rate? I don't grow soybeans, but for for uh, garden crops underneath, uh, I mean that are going to go in over a, you know, a cut down rye crop. Um, I, I th what I would say is that it depends upon when you can plant it. Like here in Iowa in the Midwest, um, you. If you can plant the rye like by the first week of September, um, even a bushel might work because then it'll tiller a lot. But if you plant it late, you won't get much tillering, you know, multiple stocks out of the one seed. And so um, the later you plant it, the, the more you need to plant. And the University of Wisconsin recommends three bushels an acre of rye across the board. But Joel Groover in um, Illinois says, if you can get it planted the last week of August or the first week of September, of September in, in you know, he's kind of lower probably than you are um, in that latitude, but that you, he can get by with one bushel per acre. Yeah, I, so Francis, we've done a lot of that work here too. And um, yes, so, so I completely agree. So one bushel of rye is what, 56 to 60 pounds. Um, but yeah, so if you can get it on the ground, same as Francis said here, the dates are, are the same, sort of end of August, 1st of September, using that much lower seeding rate. And you said broadcast, but that would be broadcast with light incorporation. Um, I don't think you, you know, just broadcasting it a, a bushel on the soil without incorporating it is, is going to give you the same results. So... It, when you start to get to the third week of September, in most places throughout New England, you're going to want to double that seeding rate. And then if you get into October, you you will want to go up to that 125 to 150 pounds, especially if you want that heavy stand for rolling. Yeah, broadcasting can be kind of uh, risky because if you don't get any rain, and you, you broadcast it at the right time and it doesn't rain for two weeks. And then sometimes the rain isn't enough to get it really going. And so I had some, last year I planted some rye and, and some of it last fall, I, I got a light rain and I think it was enough to get it, some of it sprouting and then it didn't have enough to make it through. And so some of it didn't really finish sprouting. And so it can be risky to not get, to, to not get it in the ground. I have a, quick question if there's time um, for Francis. Um, do you ever grow uh, corn on a rolled cover crop? And uh, if so, can you tell us about any experiences you've had with that? Yeah, I had, I did uh, a couple of years ago, I planted, can you hear me without my video shut off? Yep. Okay. I planted a couple acres as an experiment of um, hairy vetch and oats in the fall. And um, it came up pretty good. I got it planted early and the oats of course died over the winter, but the idea is that it protects the hairy vetch somewhat. And then um, next spring I came and we got an ice storm, a really bad ice storm that winter. I thought, oh, it all died. And I came in the spring and it looked like it had died. And, um, and I just ignored it. And then I came in like about mid June and it was just like flowering like crazy. I couldn't believe it. I hadn't paid attention. And um, so I came in with a corn planter and I planted directly into the rot, into the um, vetch. Um, and it, um, 
It wasn't a no-till torn planter, and it did really well, and it just totally knocked the vetch down. I rolled it, but I wouldn't have had to roll it. And um, what happened, it was very, I got planted late, and and um, where the vetch was thick, there really weren't any weeds, virtually no weeds. But it wasn't a real good yield because it was late, and and I think I was probably didn't have a whole lot of nitrogen. But where the, where, um, the vetch was thin, it was weedy and not good. Um, but that was my experience. And as a matter of fact, I planted another acre last fall, and I'm going to try it, try it again for the fun of it. But a friend of mine in Iowa, he did the same thing, but he planted earlier, in this planted his corn earlier, and the and he rolled the the, uh, the vetch down, and the next day the vetch was standing back up again, and he rolled it down again, and it stood up again and again and again, and finally he mowed it. The next day it came back up again, and he was mowing it. Finally, <laughs> he had a real struggle because he he. Um, it just kept coming. He did too early. Whereas I kind of came across mine late and it, when I rolled it down, it was well into the reproductive stage and it just laid down flat and it was done. So that's a key issue. Now he said he talked to the Rodell folks and they said that what you can do is start to roll that vetch a little early before you plant and stressing that vetch will make it go quicker into the rep reproductive stage. So that was a suggestion they had. I don't know if it worked for him or not, but that's that's all I know. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Excellent. I think that's it for us for now. Um, we'll all enjoy a nice lunch break and we'll see you back in the third session in a little bit. Have a good day. Thanks everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.